This time our first story is The Snake from the Long Valley by John Steinbeck, copyright 1938. It was almost dark when young Dr. Phillips swung his sack to his shoulder and left the tide pool. He climbed up over the rocks and squashed along the street in his rubber boots. The streetlights were on by the time he arrived at his little commercial laboratory on the Cannery Street of Monterey. It was a tight little building standing partly on piers over the bay water and partly on the land. On both sides, the big corrugated iron sardine canneries crowded in on it. Dr. Phillips climbed the wooden steps and opened the door. The white rats in their cages scampered up and down the wire. The captive cats in their pens mewed for milk. Dr. Phillips turned on the glaring light over the dissection table and dumped his clammy sack on the floor. He walked to the glass cages by the window where the rattlesnakes lived, leaned over and looked in. Dr. Phillips threw off his leather coat and built a fire in the tin stove. He set a kettle of water on the stove and dropped a can of beans into the water. Then he stood staring down at the sack on the floor. He was a slight young man with the mild, preoccupied eyes of one who looks through a microscope a great deal. He wore a short blonde beard. The draft ran breathily up the chimney and a glow of warmth came from the stove. The little waves washed quietly about the piles under the building. Arranged on shelves about the room were tier above tier of museum jars containing the mounted marine specimens, a laboratory dealt in. He lifted his sack to the table under the white light and emptied out two dozen common starfish. These he laid out side by side on the table. His preoccupied eyes turned to the busy rats in their wire cages. Taking grain from a paper sack, he poured it into the feeding troughs. Instantly, the rats scrambled down from the wire and fell upon the food. A bottle of milk stood on a glass shelf between a small mounted octopus and a jellyfish. Dr. Phillips lifted down the milk and walked to the cat cage. But before he filled the containers, he reached in the cage and gently picked out a big rangy alley tabby. He stroked her for a moment and then dropped her in a small black painted box, closed the lid and bolted it, and then turned on a petcock which admitted gas into the killing chamber. While the short, soft struggle went on in the black box, he filled the saucers with milk. The box was quiet now. He turned off the petcock, for the airtight box would be full of gas. On the stove, the pan of water was bubbling furiously about the can of beans. Dr. Phillips lifted out the can with a big pair of forceps, opened it, and emptied the beans into a glass dish. While he ate, he watched the starfish on the table. From between the rays, little drops of milky fluid were exuding. He bolted his beans, and when they were gone, he put the dish in the sink and stepped to the equipment cupboard. From this, he took a microscope and a pile of little glass dishes. He filled the dishes one by one with seawater from a tap and arranged them in a line beside the starfish. He took out his watch and laid it on the table under the pouring white light. The waves washed with little sighs against the piles under the floor. He took an eyedropper from a drawer and bent over the starfish. At that moment, there were quick, soft steps on the wooden stairs and a strong knocking at the door. A slight grimace of annoyance crossed the young man's face as he went to open. A tall, lean woman stood in the doorway. She was dressed in a severe dark suit. Her straight black hair, growing low on a flat forehead, was must as though the wind had been blowing it. Her black eyes glittered in the strong light. She spoke in a soft, throaty voice. May I come in? I want to talk to you. I'm very busy just now, he said half-heartedly. I have to do some things at times. But he stood away from the door and the tall woman slipped in. I'll be quiet until you can talk to me. He closed the door and brought the uncomfortable chair from the bedroom. Uh, You see, the process has started and I have to get to it. So many people wandered in and asked questions. The doctor had little routines of explanations. Uh, When starfish are sexually mature, they release sperm and ova when they're exposed at low tide. And by choosing mature specimens and taking them out of the water, I give them a condition of low tide. Now, you see, I've mixed the sperm and eggs. Now I'll put some of the mixture in each one of these ten little watch glasses, and in ten minutes I'll kill those in the first glass with menthol. Uh, Twenty minutes later I'll kill the second group, and then uh, a new group every twenty minutes. 
Then I will have arrested the process in stages, and I will uh, mount the series on microscope slides for biological study. Uh, would you like to look at the first group under the microscope? No, thank you. He turned quickly to her. People always wanted to look through the glass. She was not looking at the table at all, but at him. Her black eyes were on him, but they did not seem to see him. He realized why. The irises were as dark as the pupils. There was no color line between the two. Dr. Phillips was piqued at her answer. Although answering questions bored him, a lack of interest in what he was doing irritated him. A desire to arouse her grew in him. Uh, while I'm waiting the uh, first ten minutes, I have uh, something to do. Uh, some people don't like to see it. Maybe you'd better step into that room until I uh, finish with it. No, do what you wish. I'll wait until you can talk to me. Her hands rested side by side on her lap. She was completely at rest. Her eyes were bright, but the rest of her was almost in a state of suspended animation. And he thought, a low metabolic rate, almost as low as a frog's from the looks. And the desire to shock her out of her inanition possessed him again. He brought a little wooden cradle to the table, laid out scalpels and scissors and rigged a big hollow needle to a pressure tube. Then from the killing chamber he brought the limp dead cat and laid it in the cradle and tied its legs to hooks on the sides. He glanced sidewise at the woman. Uh, she had not moved. She was still at rest. The cat grinned up into the light, its pink tongue stuck out between its needle teeth. Dr. Phillips deftly snipped open the skin at the throat. With a scalpel, he slipped through and found an artery. With flawless technique, he put the needle in the vessel and tied it in with gut. Embalming fluid. Uh, later, I'll inject yellow mass into the venous system and red mass into the arterial system. It's for a bloodstream a dissection, biology classes. He looked around at her again. Her dark eyes seemed veiled with dust. She looked without expression at the cat's open throat. Not a drop of blood had escaped. The incision was clean. Dr. Phillips looked at his watch. Uh, time for the first group. He shook a few crystals of menthol into the first watch glass. The woman was making him nervous. He noticed how short her chin was between lower lip and point. She seemed to awaken slowly to come up out of some deep pool of consciousness. Her head raised and her dark, dusty eyes moved about the room and then came back to him. I was waiting. Her hands remained side by side on her lap. You have snakes? Why, uh, why yes, I, I have about two dozen rattlesnakes. I milk out the venom and send it to the anti-venom laboratories. She continued to look at him, but her eyes did not center on him. Rather, they covered him and seemed to see in a big circle all around him. Have you a male snake? A male rattlesnake? Well, it just happens. I, I know I have. Uh, I came in one morning and found a big snake in, uh, in coition with a smaller one. And that's very rare in captivity, you know. Uh, so you see, I do know I have a male snake. Where is he? Why, right in, in the glass cage over by that window. The woman stared down at the blunt, dry head of the snake. The forked tongue slipped out and hung quivering for a long moment. And you're sure he's a male? Well, rattlesnakes are funny. Nearly every generalization about him proves wrong, and I don't like to say anything definite about rattlesnakes, but yes, I can assure you he is a male. Her eyes did not move from the flat head. Will you sell him to me? Uh, sell him? Uh, sell him to you? Yes, you do sell specimens, don't you? Well, uh, yes, uh, of course. Uh, of course I do. How much? Five dollars? Ten? Oh, uh, not, not more than five, but uh, uh, do you know anything about rattlesnakes? You might be bitten. She looked at him for a moment. I don't intend to take him. I want to leave him here, but I want him to be mine. I want to be able to come here and look at him and feed him and to know he's mine. She opened a little purse and took out a five-dollar bill. Here, now he's mine. Dr. Phillips began to be afraid. Oh, you could come to look at him without owning him. I want him to be mine. What does he eat? Well, I feed him white rats, rats from that cage over there. 
Will you put him in the other cage? I would like to feed him. He doesn't need food now. He's had a rat already this week. Sometimes they, they don't eat for three or four months. In fact, I had one snake didn't eat for over a year. Will you sell me a rat? He shrugged his shoulders. I see. You want to watch how uh, rattlesnakes eat. All right, I'll show you. The rat will cost 25 cents. It's better than a bullfight if you look at it one way. And it's simply a snake eating his dinner if you look at it another. He hated people who made sport of natural processes. He was not a sportsman, but a biologist. He could kill a thousand animals for knowledge, but not a single insect for pleasure. He'd been over this in his mind before. She turned her head slowly toward him, and the beginning of a smile formed on her thin lips. I want to feed my snake. I'll put him in this other cage. She had opened the top of the cage and dipped her hand in before he knew what she was doing. He leaped forward and pulled her back, the lid banged shut. Haven't you any sense? Uh, maybe he wouldn't kill you, but he'd make you damn sick in spite of what I could do for you. All right, you put him in the other cage, then. Dr. Phillips was shaken. He found that he was avoiding the dark eyes that didn't seem to look at anything. He felt that it was profoundly wrong to put a rat into the cage, deeply sinful, and he didn't know why. Often he had put rats in the cage when someone or other had wanted to see it, but this desire tonight sickened him. He tried to explain himself out of it. It's a good thing to see. It shows you how a snake can work. It makes you have respect for a rattlesnake. Well, then, too, lots of people have dreams about the terror of snakes making a kill. I think because it's a subjective rat. Uh, the person is the rat. And once you see it, the whole matter becomes objective. The rat is only a rat, and the terror is removed. He took a long stick, equipped with a leather noose from the wall. Opening the trap, he dropped the noose over the big snake's head and tightened the thong. A piercing dry rattle filled the room. The thick body writhed and slashed about the handle of the stick as he lifted the snake out and dropped it in the feeding cage. He glanced at the woman. He hated to put in the rat. She had moved over in front of the new cage. Her black eyes were on the stony head of the snake again. And she said, Put in a rat. Reluctantly, he went to the rat cage. For some reason, he was sorry for the rat, and such a feeling had never come to him before. His eyes went over the mass of swarming white bodies climbing up the screen toward him. Which one, he thought, which one shall it be? And suddenly, he turned angrily to the woman. Wouldn't you uh, rather I put in a cat? Then you'd see a real fight. The cat might even win. But if it did, it might kill the snake. Uh, I'll sell you a cat if you'd like that. She did not look at him, but said, Put in a rat. I want to see him eat. He opened the rat cage and thrust his hand in. His fingers found a tail, and he lifted a plump, red-eyed rat out of the cage. It struggled up to try to bite his fingers, and failing hung spread out and motionless from its tail. He walked quickly across the room, opened the feeding cage, and dropped the rat in on the sand floor. Now, uh, watch it. The woman did not answer him. Her eyes were on the snake, where it lay still, its tongue flicking in and out rapidly. Tasted the air of the cage. The rat landed on its feet, turned around and sniffed at its pink, naked tail, and then unconcernedly trotted across the sand, smelling as it went. The room was silent. Dr. Phillips did not know whether the water sighed among the piling or whether the woman sighed. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw her body crouch and stiffen. The snake moved out smoothly, slowly. The tongue flicked in and out. The motion was so gradual, so smooth, that it didn't seem to be motion at all. In the other end of the cage, the rat perked up in a sitting position and began to lick down the fine white hair on its chest. The snake moved on, keeping always a deep S-curve in its neck. The silence beat on the young man. He felt the blood drifting up in his body, and he said loudly, See? See, he keeps the striking curve ready. Rattlesnakes are cautious, almost cowardly animals. The mechanism is very delicate. The snake's dinner is to be got by an operation which is as deft as a surgeon's job. 
and he takes no chances with his instruments. The snake had now flowed to the middle of the cage. The rat looked up, saw the snake, and then unconcernedly went back to licking its chest. The snake was close now, its head lifted a few inches from the sand. The head weaved slowly back and forth, aiming, getting distance, aiming. Dr. Phillips glanced again at the woman. He turned sick. She was weaving too. Not much, just a suggestion. The rat looked up and saw the snake. It dropped to four feet and backed up and then the stroke. It was impossible to see, simply a flash. The rat jarred as though under an invisible blow. The snake backed hurriedly into the corner from which it had come and settled down, its tongue working constantly. Perfect, cried the doctor. Perfect, right between the shoulder blades. The fangs must have almost reached the heart. The rat stood still, breathing like a little white bellows. Suddenly it leaped in the air and landed on its side. Its legs kicked spasmodically for a second and it was dead. The woman relaxed, relaxed sleepily. She turned her misty eyes to him. Will he eat it now? Of course he'll eat it. He didn't kill it for a thrill. He killed it because he was hungry. The corners of the woman's mouth turned up a trifle again. She looked back at the snake. I want to see him eat it. Now the snake came out of its corner again. There was no striking curve in its neck, but it approached the rat gingerly, ready to jump back in case it attacked. It nudged the body gently with its blunt nose and drew away. Satisfied that it was dead, the snake touched the body all over with its chin from head to tail. It seemed to measure the body and to kiss it. Finally, it opened its mouth and unhinged its jaws at the corners. Dr. Phillips put his will against his head to keep it from turning toward the woman, he thought. If she's opening her mouth, I'll be sick, I'll be afraid. He succeeded in keeping his eyes away. The snake fitted its jaws over the rat's head, and then, with a slow, peristaltic pulsing, began to engulf the rat. The jaws gripped and the whole throat crawled up and the jaws gripped again. Dr. Phillips turned away and went to his work table. He said bitterly, You made me miss one of the series. Uh, the set won't be complete now. The young man lifted the trapdoor at his feet and dropped the starfish down into the black water. He paused at the cat, crucified in the cradle, and grinning comically into the light, its body puffed with embalming fluid. He shut off the pressure, withdrew the needle, and tied the vein and asked the woman, Would you like some coffee? No, thank you. I shall be going soon. He's asleep now. I'm going now, but I'll come back and feed my snake every little while, and I'll pay for the rats. I want him to have plenty, and sometime, sometime, I'll take him away with me. Her eyes came out of their dusty dream for a moment. Remember, he's mine. Don't take his poison. I want him to have it. Good night. She walked swiftly to the door and went out. He heard her footsteps on the stairs, but he could not hear her walk away on the pavement. Dr. Phillips turned a chair around and sat down in front of the snake cage. He tried to comb out his thoughts as he looked at the torpid snake. For weeks he expected her to return, and he decided... I'll go out and leave her alone when she comes again. I, I won't see the damn thing again. She never came again. For months he looked for her when he walked about in the town. Several times he ran after some tall woman thinking it might be she. But he never saw her again, ever. The first story this evening was titled The Snake from the Long Valley by John Steinbeck. Mind Webs continues now as we hear a story written by Arthur Porges entitled The Fly. It comes from the book Short Science Fiction Tales, edited by Isaac Asimov and Groff Conklin. 
Shortly after noon, the man unslung his Geiger counter and placed it carefully upon a flat rock by a thick, inviting patch of grass. He listened to the faint, erratic background ticking for a moment, then snapped off the current. No point in running down the battery just to hear some stray cosmic rays and residual radioactivity. So far, he'd found nothing potent, not a single trace of workable ore. Squatting, he unpacked an ample lunch of hard-boiled eggs, bread, fruit, and a thermos of black coffee. He ate hungrily, but with the neat, crumbless manners of an outdoorsman. And when the last bite was gone, he stretched out, braced on his elbows to sip the remaining drops of coffee. It felt mighty good, he thought, to get off your feet after a six-hour hike through rough country. As he lay there, savoring the strong brew, his gaze suddenly narrowed and became fixed. Right before his eyes, artfully spun between two twigs in a small, mossy boulder, a cunning snare for the unwary spread its threads of wet silver in a network of death. It was the instinctive creation of a master engineer, a nearly perfect logarithmic spiral stirring gently in a slight updraft. He studied it curiously, tracing with growing interest the special cable attached only at the ends that led from a silk cushion at the web center up to a crevice in the boulder. He knew that the mistress of the snare must be hidden there, crouching with one hind foot on her primitive telegraph wire and awaiting those welcome vibrations which meant a victim thrashing hopelessly among the sticky threads. He turned his head and soon found her. Deep in the dark crevice, the spider's eyes formed a sinister, jeweled pattern. A glowing gem, glistening metallic blue, had planted itself squarely upon the web. As if manipulated by a conjurer, the blue bottle fly had appeared from nowhere. It was an exceptionally fine specimen, he decided, large, perfectly formed, and brilliantly rich in hue. He eyed the insect wonderingly. Where was the usual panic, the frantic struggling, the shrill, terrified buzzing? It rested there with an odd indifference to restraint that puzzled him. Then, as he watched, the blue bottle, stupidly perverse, gave a single sharp tug. Its powerful wings blurred momentarily and a high-pitched buzz sounded. The man sighed, almost attempted to interfere. Not that it mattered how soon the fly betrayed itself. Eventually, the spider would have made a routine inspection, and, unlike most people, he knew her for a staunch friend of man, a tireless killer of insect pests. It was not for him to steal her dinner and tear her web. But now, silent and swift, a pea on eight hairy, agile legs, she glided over her swaying net. An age-old tragedy was about to be enacted, and the man waited with pitying interest for the inevitable denouement. About an inch from her prey, the spider paused briefly, estimating the situation with diamond-bright, soulless eyes. The man knew what would follow. Utterly contemptuous of a mere fly, however large, lacking either sting or fangs, the spider would unhesitatingly close in, swathe the insect with silk, and drag it to her nest in the rock, there to be drained at leisure. But instead of a fearless attack, the spider edged cautiously nearer. She seemed doubtful, even uneasy. The fly's strange passivity apparently worried her. Reluctantly, she crept forward. In a moment, she would turn about, squirt a preliminary jet of silk over the blue bottle, and by dexterously rotating the fly with her hind legs, wrap it in a gleaming shroud. Then the man saw a startling, an incredible thing. There was a metallic flash as a jointed shining rod stabbed from the fly's head like some fantastic rapier. It licked out with lightning precision, pierced the spider's plump abdomen, and remained extended, forming a terrible link between them. The spider had stiffened as the queer lance struck home. Now she was rigid, obviously paralyzed, and her swollen abdomen was contracting like a tiny fist as the fly sucked its juices through that slender, pulsating tube. He peered more closely, raising himself to his knees and longing for a lens. It seemed to his straining gaze as if that gruesome beak came not from the mouth region at all, but through a minute hatch-like opening between the faceted eyes, with a nearly invisible square door ajar. But that was absurd. It must be the glare and uh, flickering. The rod retracted. There was definitely no such opening now. 
Apparently the bright sun was playing tricks. The spider stood shriveled, a pitiful husk still upright on her thin legs. One thing was certain. He must have this remarkable fly. If not a new species, it was certainly very rare. Fortunately, it was stuck fast in the web. Killing the spider could not help it. He knew the steely toughness of those elastic strands, each a tight helix filled with superbly tenacious gum. Very few insects, and those only among the strongest, ever tear free. He gingerly extended his thumb and forefinger. Easy now. He had to pull the fly loose without crushing it. Then he stopped, almost touching the insect and staring hard. He was uneasy, a little frightened. He reached forward again, but as his plucking fingers approached, the fly rose smoothly in a vertical ascent, lifting a pyramid of taut strands and tearing a gap in the web as easily as a falling stone. The man was alert, however. His cupped hand, nervously swift, snapped over the insect, and he gave a satisfied grunt. But the captive buzzed in his eager grasp with a furious vitality that appalled him, and he yelped as a searing, slashing pain scalded the sensitive palm. Involuntarily, he relaxed his grip. There was a streak of electric blue as his prize soared, glinting in the sun. For an instant, he saw that odd glow-worm tail light a dazzling spark against the darker sky. Then, nothing. He examined the wound, swearing bitterly. It was purple, and already little blisters were forming. There was no sign of a puncture. Evidently, the creature had not used its lancet, but merely spurted venom acid, perhaps, on the skin. Certainly, the injury felt very much like a bad burn. Damn and blast. He kicked away a real find. An insect, probably new to science. With a little more care, he might have caught it. Stiff and vexed, he got sullenly to his feet and repacked the lunch kit. He reached for the Geiger counter, snapped on the current, took one step towards a distant rocky outcrop, and froze. The slight background noise had given way to a veritable roar, an electronic avalanche that could mean only one thing. He stood there, scrutinizing the grassy knoll and shaking his head in profound mystification. Frowning, he put down the counter. As he withdrew his hand, the frantic chatter quickly faded out. He waited, half-stooped, a blank look in his eyes. Suddenly they lit with doubting, half-fearful comprehension. Cat-like, he stalked the clicking instrument, holding one arm outstretched, gradually advancing the blistered palm. And the Geiger counter raved anew. That was The Fly, a story by Arthur Porges that appeared in the book 50 Short Science Fiction Tales, edited by Isaac Asimov and Graf Conklin. This is Michael Hansen speaking, technical production for Mindwebs by Steve Gordon and Leslie Hilsenhoff. Mindwebs is a production of WHA Radio in Madison, a service of University of Wisconsin Extension. Mm-hmm.